This is East Idaho Newsmakers with Nate Eaton. Thanks for joining us this week here on East Idaho Newsmakers. We are talking with Dr. Mark Peters. He has been the director at the Idaho National Laboratory since 2015, so we're going on nearly three years now. Yes, we are. Tell us exactly what your job is out there, Dr. Peters. What do you do? Well, Nate, first of all, thanks for having me. It's good to be with you. Um, so I'm the laboratory director of Idaho National Laboratory, which means our focus is on the research and development mission that goes on here in eastern Idaho and out, at the, out in the desert. So we're, a, we're the lead lab for nuclear energy research and development, and also do other research in, in the energy space and also a lot of national security research and development. And from what I've read, there's about 4,000 employees. Yeah, we're up to over 4,200 employees 4, now. Yeah, and, and approaching $1.1 $1 .1 billion operating budget. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so. I, th I think there's a lot of, of people that might be new in eastern Idaho or even lifelong you know, residents that know about the site. Oh, there's the INL, but we don't really know what's being done every day. Right. W what is being done every day? You know, to the mom and fa father watching at home, what are you guys doing that, that's impacting our lives? So in the energy, let's start with energy. So in the energy area, it's, as I mentioned, nuclear energy. So a big part of what we do is research that will help sustain the existing fleet of nuclear reactors in the United States that are currently producing, there's 99 that are producing 20% of the electricity in the U.S., plus or minus. Um, so there's research questions associated with how you do, do you sustain the life of those plants. So we're doing a lot of work there with industry. Uh, we're also working on next, next generation reactors. Uh, I would maintain that nuclear energy needs to be an important part of our future. So what, what do next generation reactors, you've heard, probably heard a reference to small modular reactors. So mo small reactors that uh, we hope one of the first of a kind plants will be built on our site by 2026. And also then working with uh, reactor industry beyond even those, those types of designs. So what do we do? We, we actually do the, the research that's necessary to ultimately commercialize commercialize those plants. Um, the other advantage we have with the 890 square miles that's, that sits west of us here in Idaho Falls is that started its life as the National Reactor Testing Station. So we've built, demonstrated 52 reactors over the course of that history since 1949. So that still has that enabling mission of we operate four, four test reactors out there right now and we're hoping to build some additional demonstrations in, in the coming decade. How did you end up here? So I'm, I'm actually a geologist by training, uh, earth scientist, and so I started my, I got my way into the nuclear energy field through waste disposal. So I worked at Yucca Mountain, which is the national repository for ultimately burying used nuclear fuel and high level waste deep in geology. Mm -hmm. So I got into it through that, got interested in nuclear energy, became clear to me that it was an important part of our future, so I got interested there. But I'm, I'm, my expertise is more in the how do you manage spent fuel safely and securely. And did you, were you recruited to come out here to the INL or? So I've been in the national labs most of my career. I started my career at the Los Alamos National Lab okay. in New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, spent about 11 years at Argonne National Laboratory in the Chicago area. So effect, I was recruited, yeah. I was asked to apply, went through a, pro, a competitive process, interviewed and was fortunate enough to be named the director. And had you ever been to Eastern Idaho? Had you visited this facility? I, I had. Okay. I, we had done a lot of collaborations with INL, so I had been, been here, but obviously not lived here. And, uh, and my family had, quite frankly, didn't visit before we moved here. So uh, I have a very, uh, a very, very uh, loving patient, uh, willing to take risks, uh, wife and, and kids who are willing to take this adventure. Was it kind of a, a, a culture shock when you all moved here and, you, you know, know, you know yeah, I mean, going, coming from Chicago, we were in the suburbs, but that's a big, big city, right? Yeah. Uh, but not as much as you would think. Uh, there's a lot of really active, the, I was really impressed by the art, the arts here in Idaho Falls. Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, we're very active in the community. We're, we're, we're loving it. We're, you know, and we like outdoors. And so how can you not like it here, right? We like water, both frozen and unfrozen. <laughs> uh, so that actually works well for us too. So it we're, does. It's, we're settling in quite nice. Now, Rick Perry was here, was it about a year ago? Last May. Last May. Yes. So is he your boss? Um, ultimately, so it, let, let's describe a little, okay? Okay, please. So, so the labs, there are 17 labs, uh, national labs in the DOE, Department of Energy System. Um, we most of them, with the exception of one, are run by contractors. And so in our case, we're run by Battelle Energy Alliance, LLC. So that's a management and operating contractor that operates the lab for the government. And so there's a contract with the government. So my, I'm employed by Battelle Energy Alliance, LLC. 
So I report to a person at, at Patel uh, headquarters in Columbus. That's the chair of our board and also my direct report. But all the lab directors effectively work for the Department of Energy secretary. So okay. yes, it's fair to say that now he's my boss. In a, in a, yeah, in a way he is. So yes. he came out and, and what was the purpose of his visit? What did he do? He toured some of the facility. Yeah, he's been doing a terrific job. He's now been, we were the first lab to, to, vi to visit, which was a great honor, but he's now been to well more than half the labs. Mm -hmm. He made it a focus of his, of the beginning of his tenure to make sure he got around to see all the labs as much as possible. So we had him for the better part of two days, and we were able to take him to the facilities in the desert. Uh, the Navy was also with us, so we were to able to take him to the Naval Reactors facility as well, and showed him the science and technology that we do. Um, he's got uh, a lot of, uh, high priority on both nuclear energy and cybersecurity, which are important things we do. So it was it was a great set of conversations. Does it say something about the lab here that he came here first? Are, are you guys kind of leading the way compared to all of the other labs, or are you all doing the same sort of work? There's just multiple locations. I, I, we're doing different types of work. I think it does say something about us because, like I said, he's committed to nuclear energy and cybersecurity as important priorities. And so I think it does say something that he that he came here because we have leadership position in that area. Let's talk about cybersecurity. I think I saw a, a CNN video. Or one of the national news organizations did an in-depth piece about cybersecurity and the steps you guys are taking to make, make it secure. Fill us in on, on what's going on. So we're, we're less about you know, what you would consider IT cyber, you know, protecting from, from malware on your computer or whatnot. Uh, that's a focus for us operationally, but our research is more focused on what I'll call control systems. So think about little digital boxes that control everything from the grid to any kind of critical infrastructure, a military platform, um, your car, little digital control systems. Those are actually the, the part of a system that's most, most vulnerable to a cyber attack. And so if you can attack those, you can bring, you could potentially bring down critical infrastructure, like the grid, for example. So we're experts at understanding that vulnerability, how to protect it, and more importantly, how to design such that future systems would be even more resistant to that attack. Over the past 10 years, how has that focus changed as the world's become more reliant on technology? Oh, it definitely has. In fact, there's this interesting tension, right? Because you've got technology like the smart grid, like smart, you know, everything's becoming smarter. Uh, which I think I'm a technology optimist, so I love that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, that has tended to outpace the ability of, for us to protect the systems from things like cyber attack. So there's an interesting balance. You want to allow that innovation, but at the same time, you need to think about upfront about designing in defense against things like cyber. So we're doing, th we would call it cyber informed engineering. So as you engineer, design and engineer a system, think about cyber threat upfront so that it's better protected when it's actually fielded. Could there be a major cyber attack on the site, on the INL? On the INL, the, the labs and the government do a very, very good job of protecting our assets. Uh, now, is, is it without vulnerability? No, but I, I feel confident that we've got good protection. But could the grid, for example, be, be vulnerable to a cyber attack? Yes. Um, so that's why we're doing the research. Um, and the United States has put a strong, strong priority in protecting that critical infrastructure. So, you know, we're staying ahead of it, but it's an area of active, active, not only research, but also operational focus within, within the government. You guys recently broke ground on, or announced two buildings, two new buildings? Correct. What will those be used for? Tell us about that project. So, so they were, it, was a, it was a partnership with the state of Idaho, and in particular with the Idaho State Building Authority and the State Board of Education. And we, we collaborated with the, with the university, so Idaho State, Boise State, and University of Idaho. Two buildings, Collaborative Computing Center, I'll talk about them in a minute, and the Cyber Core Integration Center, so computing. So we're, we're, we are always looking to build the next generation of really big, fast computer uh, that can do something like 10 to the 15 operations per second. So if you scientific notation, that's a lot of operations per second. Yeah. Um, very, very fast computer. You do science with those computers and, it, and computing, computational science is very collaborative these days. So one of those buildings will house our next generation computer that will provide and then that will be collaborative with the universities. Uh, and so, and there are lots of space for interaction, students, postdocs to come in and whatnot. And the second building is focused on our cyber mission, but not only our cyber mission, but the collaborative programs that we have with the universities. So those will both be built here in Idaho Falls at the Research and Education Campus. And I imagine this would be a way to get undergrads or those doing graduate work jobs. 
potential jobs. Yeah, that's what I'm most excited about is the students because that's, that's where the university collaborations come in, to have more students interested in those fields, but also from the Idaho perspective, keeping those students here, right? Uh, you, know, you know, we have this challenge in the state of Idaho. We, we train these great kids and then they go away. We need to keep them here. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really a strong linkage. That we as INL can be an important part of Idaho as well, not just the nation. So you've got these new buildings going in, that working with the universities. What about other growth out at the site? Is there potential to grow in other areas in the coming years? Yeah, yes, we are. We're, we, you know, if, if you measure it in many ways. Let's talk about buildings first. We're building, we have, we're in the planning phase for at least three new buildings at the site that are funded directly by the federal government as opposed to the partnerships that we mentioned earlier with the state. So there's new facilities coming in. I talked about the promise of potentially demonstrating the first small modular reactor on our site by 2026. So there's a lots of opportunities for growing, not only growing business volume and people, but also our impact. So and, very and, exciting. And what would that small modular, modular reactor do for those people that aren't you know, scientific? Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? So it's actually producing electricity. So it's a partnership between the, the reactor designer, which is a company called New Scale, based in Oregon, Corvallis, Oregon, uh, with, with the laboratory, with DOE, and with a utility consortium called the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. We call it UAMPS. So it's a bunch of municipal utilities that have collaborated. They're looking for ways to produce energy in the mid-20s that will basically replace aging coal plants. So it's real, electri real electricity on the grid. Idaho Falls Power is a prominent member of this consortium. So we have active collaborations with Jackie Flowers and her team here in town. Uh, she's an important part of that. But it would be producing not only electricity for the lab, but also for the region. Could that, in effect, make rates go down? I mean, let's say if, if you switch to all nuclear, could, could that ever happen? I mean, is that a possibility? Ultimately, one of the challenges with nuclear is the capital costs are very high to get them on the grid. Mm -hmm. they're, they're expensive to get on the grid, but once they're on the grid, they operate for decades. So if you amortize that over the time of operation, they, they tend to be very affordable. Um, so I, I, you know, I wouldn't commit, you'd have to ask Jackie exactly how the rates would be affected. Um, but in general, it's reliable, resilient, and it's clean. It's it, it, no, no greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of value. Let's talk a little bit about the U.S. Department of Energy's Advanced Mix Waste Treatment Plan. Um, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, bringing, this was getting rid of waste or treating the waste, and the program was supposed to stop this year. But there's talk of potentially expanding it out. Uh, do you have any, any, can you kind of explain that or tell us where that stands at this uh, point? I can explain it, uh, but I'll start by telling you that it's not our responsibility. Uh, it's, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're the research and development, mm -hmm. and that is a fun that's a cleanup function. So that's separately managed by Floor Idaho, which is a separate contract with DOE. Um, but I can give you a little bit of background that I know about. Sure. So it, it, as you know, Advanced Mixed Waste Treatment Project, it, it is treating the waste that came from Rocky Flats in Colorado and was brought to Idaho decades ago. And they're in the process of, of retrieving it, compacting it, packaging it for shipment to the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. They are nearly complete with that existing mission. So the conversation that you're hearing go on is their further mission for that facility go forward. That's not a that's not a mark thing. That's not an INL thing. That's for others to decide. That's them. So you really don't have any involvement no. in that. No, none at all. Do you want to voice your opinion about what you think should happen? Uh, no, I'd ra you know I'd just let let the Department of Energy decide how how that plays out. I just would really want to emphasize that that's not the INL mission. Yeah. You know, and so if I may, please. Yeah. Let's talk. It, it relates to the settlement agreement, right? Yeah. The, this with the state, and you may want to talk about that more anyway. So. So if I think about the settlement agreement, it's an incredibly powerful agreement that protects the state, protects our interests, keeps the aquifer clean, sustainable. Um, but people tend to maybe don't remember that it had two, two, fo two focal points. One was to make sure you clean up the legacy, but also to make sure that INL was vital as, as an R&D lab go forward. And, and so I, I, I think it's important to know that both those things are important. So I think the cleanup needs to absolutely continue and, and we should keep that focus. But we also need to remember that there's the INL R&D mission that gets affected by some of this. And so the faster we can progress through cleanup and get over some of these hurdles, the better for, I think, the state. We talked a little bit about growth and, and the new buildings and whatnot. How do you attract top talent to the site? 
it starts with exciting vision, mission, uh, you know, uh, we're attracting particularly our science and technology talents coming from really around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love it here, you love it here. Uh, but if somebody has the choice, come to Chicago or San Francisco area or come to Idaho Falls. So you got to start with exciting vision and mission, and I think we have that. And then quite frankly, once we get the kids here, uh, they, they, they tend to love, love it a lot. But there's a lot to do there. We've got, we've got great partnerships with the city, with both Idaho Falls and Ammon, to, to, you know, as they develop cool spaces for younger people to come and live in and whatnot, that's important to us. But what I can control is a vital lab with cool science. And so that, that's what we focus on. You guys do um, some interactions, some relationships with the community as far as reaching out to schools and sponsoring local events. Uh, what, what is your goal? What is your mission as far as having that relationship with our community as well as this world-class facility? Yeah, it's, it's very much a priority. And I, I personally spend a lot of time on it as well because I think it's important. Really three, three aspects. One is what I would characterize as community engagement. So giving back, a lot of, you know, give, give to the Arts Council. I'm just rattling off a few examples. Um, and then we also have a lot of investment back in economic development. We give to Ready, we give to the, the Eastern Idaho Economic Development Organizations, we give to Bannock County Development as well. Um, providing resources to, this, to, to the town of Arco to help them as they think about what their future looks like. So there's that component. But then also a large investment in K, pre-K through 12 particularly STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Why do we do that? Because whether they come work at INL or go work somewhere else, you need to get kids excited about science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'll in particular call it getting uh, girls, young women, excited in that field. Um, and keep, you know, getting them excited and then having them be interested in it as a career. So it helps us, right? Because you create that pipeline of people who may eventually want to work at the lab. But also, I, I, you know, you wouldn't surprise you, you that I'm going to say this, but I think science and technology is an important part of solving the world's challenges. So we need more talent, more kids going into those fields. You've been at the site nearly three years now. What has been your biggest, what have you learned? What's been the biggest thing you've learned? Um, how, I, I knew about the lab before I came, but I didn't fully appreciate the breadth of areas that we work. I knew about the nuclear energy mission, which mm -hmm. I have great passion for, but I didn't fully appreciate the full breadth of our national security mission and, our, and our, some of our other mission space and how much we're doing in that area. So that was, a, that was I've had a lot of pleasant surprises. That was, the, that was one. I didn't fully, having come from sh working in a lab in Chicago, uh, you know, you, you get lost in Chicago real quick. Here, I knew that it, the lab was an important part of Idaho and particularly Eastern Idaho but I didn't fully appreciate how, how big of an employer we are and how visible we are and how important it is that we play that role in the community. So that's all, it's all been fun. I'm having, a, I'm having a grand time. But those have all been interesting surprises. How about leadership lessons being over ultimately 4,200 people? I know they don't all directly report to you, but what have you learned as a leader, maybe with this job or jobs in the past as far as being effective? Um, I would say, you know, th this is probably something anybody would say, but it's, it's, it's delegation and empowering your people. Because I will tell you, with 4,200, but I spend a lot of time outside. I'm on, the, I'm on a lot of airplanes, mm -hmm. going to Washington, D.C. a lot, for example, headed there tomorrow. Um, and and you, don't, you don't run a lab from airplanes. So you have to have good people. And, and I've learned how important it is to have that strong team around you, that strong senior team but also how to set strategy and have that flow throughout the organization. And I'm still learning how to do that. But communication, communication, communication. You cannot talk to people enough. So getting out there and try to talk to the lab as much as possible. But I'm finding there's just not enough time, right? So part of it's just been the, the thing I'm still working on is how do you, how do you balance all of that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big challenge. We talked a minute ago about the, the waste out there, and this may not fall under your umbrella either, but for those people that are concerned, you hear the word nuclear and it's, I mean, I envision the Simpsons, you know, right, the, sure. the nuclear power plant, and uh, we don't want a, an explosion, we don't want anything like that. Are those valid concerns for people living here to have that, oh, what if something blows up at the site? Or now, I can understand why those criticisms exist, or why that perception exists. I mean, it would have been mushroom clouds yeah, you know, and now now you think of you, know, you think of Homer, right? Yep. Uh, right. You know, and green stuff the losing green everywhere. Tubes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
There is spent fuel and nuclear waste stored at the site. It's being stored safely and securely, but is that the permanent solution? Ultimately, you've got to develop a repository to isolate this material, but right now it's being stored safely. I will tell you there's no concerns about any kind of Homer Simpson scenario. Now, I will say, you know, it's not here in Idaho, but there has been accidents in the nuclear industry that, that, are, that are known. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima are the three ones that are most visible. And the industry does a good job of learning from those accidents, but I will tell you that there's, no, there's not really any scenarios where you have that kind of thing happen at, happen at the site. And I guess if, if something were to happen, I know we heard about the ruptured barrels a right. few days ago. Right. There, there's procedures in place to take care of those type of things? There, there, there are, and we, we, had, we, we had fire department that responded to that. They responded in the right way. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased everybody, that there was no, no injuries or anything. But the building's designed such that any, if the, I don't, we don't know yet what's go in detail. Again, it's not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's isolated inside the building. There was not any releases outside the building. And, and that would be a similar thing no matter where it happened. If there was to be some kind of release, the, the, there's enough, def we, we call it defense in depth. The, the engineering is such that we can, we can protect from any external releases from the building. And we have very robust controls that protect our employees as well. Where do you foresee the lab in 10, 20 years? I think uh, revitalizing the National Reactor Testing Station. So I'm hope, um, I would like to see more than one new reactor being demonstrated at the site. I, I'd like to see the lab grow a little bit more um, I, you know, it, and, and maintain this sort of, you know, you know for, yeah, I like 4,500 employees. That would be a good, that would be a good size uh, to sustain where we want to go. Um, but I'd like us to see our, increase our science and technology impact in a major way. Um, and I love seeing new facilities because that's part of attracting capability and people. So, uh, you know, I'm quite excited. I think this lab in 10 years is going to be one of the best in the system. There's growth out at the actual site site, but also in Idaho Falls as well as far as facilities are, are concerned. Do you foresee more of that? Maybe more in the city? I do, I do. So if University Boulevard, where a lot of this is happening, has transformed. I mean, when you asked me, had I been here before? When I first came, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got two new ones coming up. We've got a campus plan that would involve continued expansion. Uh, not quite sure exactly where that's gonna go next. That's, that's sort of next on my plate, is to work with the team to figure out that strategy. But there'll be more, I can guarantee you, over the next 10 years, there's gonna be more coming on University Boulevard as well. What, we're, we're, this is called the East Idaho Newsmaker, so we talk with newsmakers here in East Idaho, but we talk about East Idaho. You and your family, what are, what are some of the things you guys like to do here in Eastern Idaho? You mentioned water, cold and, and warm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we like, so my wife likes to downhill ski. Uh, my, my son does as well. Uh, we've both gotten into cross country. I'm a little bit more cross country, that's just better for me. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, along the frozen lines, my, my youngest daughter who's still living with us, she goes to high school here in town, she's a hockey player. So we, during the winter, hockey season, we spend a lot of time in the car driving to tournaments. I love that. Uh, we're gonna be on the water. It will be at Bear Lake, Redfish Lake, and a whole bunch of places this summer. Um, we've started to get into fly fishing. Had a great fly fishing outing last, my wife and I did last August. And so we're, we've, got, we've bought waders and we've got rods as well. So we're, we're just living it. I would imagine yeah. your commute's a bit shorter here compared to it's Chicago. A bit easier. Yeah. I live just south of town, it works out quite well for me. And one yeah. or two stoplights, yeah. maybe. Uh, for yeah. those people watching, that, that, anything you want people to know about the site that we haven't touched on, about the INL, what's going on, or myths or rumors you've heard, anything that you want to... Yeah, well, we've covered a lot of, we've covered a lot of ground. I, I, I guess I would start with the nuclear energy mission and, and just re, re, reassure everyone that, you know, we have the best interests of our employees and the public in mind, and it's about protecting the aquifer. So nothing we would do out there would, would uh, damage the aquifer. Uh, but we're thinking about what's, what's next for nuclear energy. How do you produce systems that are even safer, more secure, and minimize the amount of waste that's produced? So know that we're thinking about what's that bright future. Um, and also, I, I tell my, my folks there almost every day, you realize you come in every morning and you're, you're saving the world. And I, and I mean that, right? We're developing solutions that will help protect all of us. And I, I just find that amazing. Um, so, and I would encourage people to come check us out, actually. I, to me, you can't really fully understand what we do until you come see some of it. And we have many, many opportunities for folks to come, 
come see the facilities here in, in town and also out in the desert. Yeah, I know that at least last year there was an open house, a public open right. house on a Saturday, and we can, of course, post information about that as, as those events come up. Dr. Peters, thank you for being with us here today on East Idaho Newsmakers. Dr. Peters is the man in charge at the Idaho National Laboratory, has been since October of 2015. We will include links to the INL websites if you want to learn more about uh, the INL and their mission and what they're doing. And we thank you for watching. Have a good week.